You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Politicians and business leaders love to talk about regionalism. Planners love to talk about Cincinnati, Covington, and Newport as all parts of a single downtown basin. But scratch below the surface and people living north of the river just don't take the community south of the river seriously, much less think of them as co-equal partners. In almost anything, reality may change, but mental paradigms don't shift until observers absorb a series of shocks. Cincinnatians received another shock two weeks ago when this weekend's Inland Seafood Festival announced its move from Bicentennial Commons in downtown Cincinnati to the Newport Riverfront. In the last decade, Newport has attracted millions of dollars in investment funds. The transformation is most obvious on the riverfront, where floating restaurants and bars led the way in the 1980s. By moving the flood wall back, Newport carved out space for shore-based restaurants and hotel to revitalize the eastern waterfront. All along, the city implemented efforts to upgrade the city's image, including a river walk drawing on the community's history. When the aquarium dropped anchor in Newport in 1999 after a contest with both Covington and Cincinnati, people could feel that the tide had shifted. In October, Newport on the levee will open with a plan that looks a lot like what the politicians rejected for the Cincinnati Riverfront. One component of that development will be an IMAX theater that was once projected for Fountain Square West in downtown Cincinnati. But the change isn't just on the riverfront. Public and private dollars are going into improvements in the business district. And in the east side residential neighborhoods, years of rehabbing and reinvestment are finally showing fruit. So does Newport know something Cincinnati doesn't? And is what we see in Newport now the culmination or just the beginning? To answer those and hopefully more questions, I am joined by Tom Gadouli, the mayor of the city of Newport, and Phil Shepardini, the city manager. Phil, welcome back. Tom, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you for having Thank us. Um, this whole thing with the Inland Seafood Festival, it sort of hit the press and hit Cincinnatians by surprise seemingly just a few weeks before the festival. Something must have been happened. When, when did you first start talking to the, uh, the managers of the festival about this, Tom? Well, it's probably been about six months ago. They were interested. They knew that the Italian festival and the arts and music festival and, of course, of uh, some of the new festivals that were going and also the Boys and Girls Club uh, car show and chili cook-off was all going to be there this year. And, and, the, and the idea that uh, the whole levee project and the aquarium is there and it makes a nice site, a good feeling, a park feeling with, uh, of course, at nighttime, the backdrop of downtown Cincinnati, which is pretty impressive from the Newport side. Some people do say that the uh, the best view of the Cincinnati skyline is from the northern Kentucky, you might say the Newport uh, riverfront. Well, there's no doubt in my mind, being mayor of Newport, that that's the best view of downtown Cincinnati. And, uh, and we have a good re working relationship with uh, the people from the uh, festival. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, they were in pretty impressed at what's going on and uh, pretty supportive of what's going on in Newport. Phil, um, the, the a festival is one thing, but we're not just talking about festivals in Newport. We're talking about all kinds of development that I tried to at least outline there. What is it? Why has Newport been able to move forward on this kind of development? What, what's the secret, so to speak? The secret uh, basically is teamwork. Uh, you hear that a lot, that you know, teamwork is uh, the key to success, and uh, uh, I think Newport exhibits that very well. Uh, it's been a long process. It's not an overnight success, but essentially you have a group of, of elected leaders in the city uh, working with the appointed staff, and we all work together as a co cohesive team. Then you bring in uh, state government and our state representatives, uh, the governor, uh, organizations such as the, the Chamber and Triad and South Bank Partners, and all those coming together as a group uh, we kind of hash out any differences uh, uh, of opinion, and then we move forward. And, and so we're able to harness that focus and working together uh, makes it uh, become a reality. Let me, let me sort of approach two of the things you just, two parts of the things that you just said, Phil, in different ways. One of the things is that, um, you know, working together and you're talking about inside of Newport itself. 
There are a lot of people who say, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on Cincinnati, but a lot of people who say trying to work with the bureaucracy can drive you nuts to get anything done. You're saying that in Newport, and I got to tell you that I hear this from other people, it's not just my observation, that a call to the Newport administration gets directed to the right office and people get answers. Is there something that you try to do? Is, is, it, a, is it a matter of size? Newport is smaller than, you know, than some other places, Cincinnati or whatever, or is it a different management philosophy? I think uh, size is a factor. Uh, you know, when you're smaller, that uh, you're able to respond quicker. Uh, but you know, our philosophy is is that uh, you need to be responsive uh, in order to, to to get things accomplished. And uh, uh, I think it's been fair to say uh, over the years that that the city of Newport has has reacted, uh, you know, very quickly and effectively in dealing with developers and, and citizens at large. Tom, uh, another thing that Phil said was talked about the cooperation, not just inside of Newport, but you know, inside of Northern Kentucky and statewide. And again, one of the things that strikes me is the state of Kentucky has played a significant role in doing some real investing in Newport, has recognized Newport for what it's doing. What, how important is our state dollars to what's happening in Newport? Oh, it's, it's been a great relationship. I think that the Tourism Act is probably uh, the Would most Would you explain the Tourism Act for those of us who don't know well, how the Tourism really Act of Kentucky is that basically the revenue generated by the project that, that is going in at the, the levee and, and the aquarium and, and all the surrounding areas there, that 25% of the revenue on the tax dollars collected will come back to the developer. So at the same time, we're creating 75% new revenue for the state. The 25% helps the project and kicks off the is project. Is that in perpetuity, or is that uh, how long does that 25%? How does that how long does that go? How does that work? Or it go, it goes. Years, it, it's a 10-year payback. Certain amount of years. payback. Yeah, it's based on the uh, sales tax generated from the project. They re recover 25% of the cost of their development over a 10-year period. It, am I correct that Newport has made more use of that state law than any other community in Kentucky? Well, have that, I was, heard that? that was pretty interesting because the legislator was actually from Eastern Kentucky and they were trying to create tourism in Eastern Kentucky. And uh, matter of fact, he was up here for uh, in Northern Kentucky and we, we, we uh, thanked him uh, several times for, yeah, because Northern Kentucky has used that for, you know, the, also for the uh, new, uh, uh, the racetrack, Northern Kentucky Racetrack, okay. and uh, oh, for the, down in uh, Jerry Carroll's right, and, and and also we've we've been the biggest user of that with uh, what's going on in Newport. And it's very been very exciting, and uh, you know we've got a state representative, Jim Callahan, is really effective. Uh, I mean, the governor comes up, and we have a very good relationship with him, and I think that Newport really has that can-do attitude, and we're very accessible. You know, the Newport on the levee, which open in October, is that correct? Or is it phased? Or? It, it'll be phased in, but the facility itself will be open in, in uh, October, uh, and, and some of the major tenants will be in place. Yeah, the tenants, Barnes & Noble, Gameworks, Brio Tuscan Grill, Mitchell's Fish Market, the IMAX, 20 theaters, the AMC theaters, uh, a club, uh, showboat, cabaret. Given those that you have announced, uh, what, what's left? How much, what percentage of, of it, it has been leased and what's still left to be leased? Can't really get into the, the percentage leased and, and what's still out there. I know that they've talked to literally hundreds of prospective tenants and they're just continuing to try to get the right mix for this particular development. Uh, but we're very excited about what they have officially announced and obviously there's others that, that uh, we can't talk about at this point. But when it's all said and done, we're looking at about 50 different tenants in that complex. Okay, so we're still just seeing the tip of the yes. iceberg in total numbers. Correct. So 50 different tenants. What's the total square footage? Uh, including the aquarium, it's a, a 500,000 square feet, and we refer that to as the 500,000 square feet of fun, which that, that complex will be. Okay. So now one of the other things I tried to focus on was, you know, a lot of people know about what's happening on the riverfront, have some sense of what's happening on the riverfront. But I tried to make the point that it's not just on the riverfront, it's also in the downtown and in the residential areas of Newport. Let me ask a couple questions about that. Um, what's happening on the riverfront with the levee? 
What's going to be the impact on your business, your traditional business district? Is this going to suck everything to the riverfront? Is this going to be a problem, or is this going to feed your riverfront or your business district? Well, we're planning and, and trying to make sure that it feeds our uh, downtown business district and brings our downtown business district back to life. You know, all the small downtowns have suffered over the years due to shopping centers and changes, but uh, we're really uh, investing in our downtown. We're spending four million dollars on uh, infrastructure and sidewalks and street furniture, which and is some of what we saw there. And you've seen part of that in there, and also follow up with some facade matching funds for the storefronts, uh, putting together a pretty good package for new businesses to come in, and and uh, at the same time, it's going to connect to the riverfront, and that. Uh, we're looking for a good service and entertainment areas too on Mama Street. We want to serve the residents. You know, our historic district has really taken off, and people with a disposable income and trying to connect that all of a great livable city. And that, of course, we're very small, and you know, we're three miles by three miles, and that everybody can actually walk to everything and and have all the uh, neat things that uh, are you know that you would want to walk to in, in your town to eat and drink and party and and. Uh, you know, just a, a fun place to be and a good place to live. You know, given all of the investment that's occurred over the last, well, very obviously over the past decade, but you've been working on it even longer than that, but still population has steadily declined in Newport. Uh, 1970, about 26,000, uh, 2000, about 17,000. Uh, is that a worry for you? And are you going to, are you looking to see to change the, the, the number of people who live in Newport? I think it, uh, the census, uh, you could look at it as a concern. Um, I don't really see it as a concern for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, our focus on housing, uh, and, and the mayor obviously could talk better about, about uh, the efforts there, uh, but housing revitalization, uh, uh, which leads into neighborhood stabilization, we're looking at more quality than, than, than you know, trying to up the numbers of residents, uh, and 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 we feel like that that is in full swing with some initial programs America talk about. But the one thing that people don't realize when you look at the old numbers to the to the current numbers is that um, you know people don't have big families anymore. Newport, both both uh, Mayor and I grew up in the city. You know, seven, eight, ten, fifteen kids were not uncommon. Uh, uh, we came from families of six and seven. Uh, which really weren't all that big by comparison. So people don't have that many kids, so that's going to take... So if we take looked at the households as opposed to just raw population, you're saying it's some of that difference is just in the family structure. Ex exactly. And, and so I, I think there's too much play on the numbers, especially in our case. Okay. You know, one of the things, and, and uh, over on those east side neighborhoods where there's a lot of revitalization and attracting a number of Cincinnatians, our traditional Cincinnatians, John Williams, for example, mm -hmm. and just retired head of the chamber, lives right. in Newport. I think a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so that that's a lot of rehab. But you've also got a lot of cleared land in the downtown as well. Is some of that, do you, can you project some of that as housing, Tom? Well, I, I think there's a, I mean, to explain what's going on, there's a lot happening in the housing end. And I took that on about six years ago, and we started with the beginning of the public housing change, and we applied for Hope Six Grant. Cincinnati's got one also, and it really changes public housing as it is today. And did you get a Hope Six? Yes, we did. Okay. It, it took us six years, but we did it, and uh, and that's that's probably going to be a reinvestment in our housing, probably close to about ninety million dollars by the time you add all these. So, are we going to see the same type of thing we're seeing in the West End of Cincinnati, where you're tearing down some of the older public housing and rebuilding it? No, it's not, it's not going to be like that. We believe that the property that public housing on is right on the riverfront, next, you know, right next to the river walk, right next to right. The, where we're having our festivals. And we think that's a better commercial redevelopment. At the same time, we could have some housing in there, but a, a good mix. And that will create more uh, revenue for changes in our infrastructure, more housing improvements, so more upgrades. So some of that public housing could actually be moved physically? Nine different neighborhoods. Nine it's all so be, you're scattering it. And it's all going to be privatized going to be privatized. So it's a great concept and uh, we're the first one in the nation to do this. Okay. To, to uh, separate it out and and, and Has the construction on that started yet? No. We're going to have to follow that. Yeah, that's Okay. Uh, uh, in talking about privatizing, uh, also you're talking about selling your waterworks, privatizing your waterworks. Phil, what's that about? 
Uh, basically, uh, over the past couple of years, we've really looked at uh, the Newport Waterworks, which has uh, been in existence for over 125 years. And, and we feel uh, with the small customer base that we have and the increasing amount of federal and state regulations for uh, water quality and EPA issues, uh, that we're just not able to keep up uh, financially without really burdening our customer base. And so we've been looking at uh, what it looks like if we hang on to the system into the future versus uh, selling it. And uh, just this week, we received a couple of bids, and we're going to be pursuing a bid offered by the, the Northern Kentucky Water District, uh, which is the largest uh, supplier of water in, in the Northern Kentucky area. And it's going to be on for discussion uh, Monday night at the city commission meeting. Which is, uh, the show's airing on Sunday morning, so that's tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. Final question, Tom, we're just about 30 seconds. Uh, what's the big thing we're going to see in Newport next? What, do you, what are you most excited about? Well, I think the housing, the changes, and, and there's a full package on that. And it, it, it's, it's pretty complex, but it's in nine different neighborhoods, but also some upgrade housing in uh, probably four different neighborhoods. And it, it's really impressive stuff that's happening, condos and high end. And well, thank you. I'm going to have you back so we can keep learning from what you guys are doing over there. So very good. Stay tuned. After the break, I'll be joined by the representatives of a new grassroots organization to make sure life in Cincinnati is sustainable for the future generations. Welcome back. Sustainable Cincinnati is a regional effort undertaken by 21 groups to develop a local economy, ecology, and quality of life that is interconnected and vital. The first step in this effort has been the institution of what the group calls a regional indicators program. To discuss the Sustainable Cincinnati Initiative, I am joined by Allison Levitt, a landscape architect and environmental planner. Dr. Levitt holds a PhD in social and ecological dynamics of regional ecosystem management. We'll say that four, four times. <laughs> and Sterling Euler who has served as a council member and mayor of Fairfield, Ohio, and is the immediate past president of the OKI Regional Council of Governments. Mr. Euler serves as the chair of the Health, Environment, and Drainage Committee of Sustainable Cincinnati. Welcome to Newsmakers. Um, thank you. Thank you. Allison, let's start. <coughs> what is, I mean, those were, I was sort of repeating the official words there. What really is the goal of Sustainable Cincinnati, and why did it emerge at this time? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, the goal really is to um, develop a set of indicators, 10 to 20, that for the entire region that um, speaks to social, economic, and environmental issues. Hopefully we'll be able to merge those issues together in indicators that will provide long-term measurements for the health of the city okay, so <coughs> or the region as, as a whole. So this is, first off, it's a regional approach. Right. And indicators. Uh, Sterling, what, what would Okay, 10 to 20. Give me some examples <coughs> of uh, what the indicators might be, and I, I see you're on the, a specific committee. So I yes, the uh, indicators can be a number of things, from the, uh, the social fabric of the community to the environmental uh, implications. For example, uh, from an environmental standpoint, this region is absolutely and totally dependent on two sources of water supply for its needs, the Ohio River and a buried aquifer that runs up through Butler County. If the quality of that water or the quantity of that water were to show a signs of diminishing over time, this region would have to react to that in a positive way to ensure its long-term existence. So as an indicator, what you would do is find some standard by which to measure quality and quantity at this moment so that it could be tracked. This is, in effect, creating a baseline. Exactly. Is yes. that what you're doing? Yes, exactly. And getting concurrence that that is, in fact, an indicator of long-term sustainability. Okay. See, there are a lot of things that are, are indicators, but we want to get to the root cause. For example, the, the dropout rate of youth in, in Cincinnati schools is undoubtedly a problem, but is it a symptom or is it, is it in itself the fundamental root cause? So we want to work down to those fundamental issues, identify them, get concurrence that those are issues, and then track them through time and try to find ways to make them better. Allison, what would be an, another type of indicator? A water quality <coughs> quantity would be one. What would be another one? A traditional indicator um, may be something like the median income, but a more sustainable indicator might be um, the actual hours 
that members of the household have to work in order to meet their basic needs of the family. And so if you, if you think about those two kinds of indicators, the sustainable one speaks to um, issues across um, social and economic um, concerns. If, if the family has two um, wage earners and both of them have to work 60 hours a week just to meet their basic needs, then what is that saying about the rest of the quality of the family? Do some of, do some of this, are you constantly also measuring in relationship to other metropolitan areas? Is, 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 are you trying to say where does Cincinnati rank vis-a-vis uh, -vis New York or Portland or Austin or whatever? Is that part of what's going on here too? I think that's part of the framework in which we operate because it gives us a, a, a database to start uh, selecting our parameters. But ultimately, we have to look at Cincinnati, greater Cincinnati from a greater Cincinnati perspective because we are really unique in the sense that when we talk a region, we're talking three states, uh, 12 or so counties, uh, an almost infinite number of little independent governments. Yeah, so, so 480, <laughs> yeah. supposedly. So uh, it's a different kind of a situation. Now, why did this effort, do you think, emerge at this point in time? I think that there are a lot of different things happening in this region and have been over the last few years that um, precipitated it. Um, it. It started out of an effort from the League of Women Voters um, with a desire to um, make some changes and to be able to document the, the process. And it turns out that there are, are other organizations that are now working through um, or working on specific regional issues and within their own local um, communities that is, things are coming to a head. Um, it's time for the uh, Hamilton County um, Regional Plan Commission is looking at doing planning across the whole county and incorporating all the small individual communities. The city of Cincinnati is beginning um, comprehensive planning. Um, OKI is starting to do um, open, space, open space planning for the entire eight county region. Did, so all these things are coming together at one time. But and did this group get generated out of those efforts or from the community grassroots sort of in response to those efforts? I, I think it, it is this began, a government agency? No, 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 it's a grassroots effort, and it's a coalition of organizations. And actually, right now we have over 55 organizations involved in this: okay. social organizations, environmental organi organizations, and economic organizations. Sterling, does, do these organizations? And you did give me a list of the 21, I guess, that were helping the to original found planning. It. Yeah, uh -huh. I didn't. I don't see the 55. Is there a particular political angle to these? No, not at all. I think it's probably one of the most apolitical things I've been associated with in 35 years of, of public service uh, because there's a wide spectrum of, of, of different kinds of agenda brought to this table, and that's why I think it has a good chance of being very successful. When will you have these indicators, these benchmarks, sort of developed into a st uh, uh, to a level where these different planning agencies can use them? Mm -hmm. Uh, the plan currently is to have a, um, a potential set of indicators that we will be able to analyze more near the end of the year and in the first part of next year then we will present to the community our final set of indicators. And then what happens? Well we hope then to find sponsors uh, for the different uh, indicators because they will be uh, across a wide spectrum of topic areas and so there we would hope that uh, the environmental community would pick on the environmentally based ones and agree to track and report on those over time. Uh, some will be uh, health based, I'm sure, and we'd look at the medical community to track and report on those. Some will be perhaps educational. Will they only based. track and report or will they advocate particular types of decisions? Ultimately, that'll have to be their decision. If they accept the job of tracking them, we would hope they would do it in an, an agenda free way. But that's too much to hope, I suppose. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope that once you get to these, you'll contact me and we'll get you back on and we'll talk about the specifics. Oh, that'd and we'll be great. And yeah. we'll see where it goes in the future as you move forward. We'd so thank you that. very much for being thank here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men shaping our community for the future. Have a good week. Stay with